good. All right, my devices are rolling. You are live. Chair, the floor is yours. Okay, well, good morning, everyone, or afternoon, and uh, welcome to the uh, meeting of the Delta Independent Science Board. I hope you're all uh, healthy, you and your families, and, uh, and trying to keep happy under these uh, difficult times, and appreciate you all joining us this morning. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting officially to order, and we'll start off by doing a roll, roll call and declaration, declarations of any new conflicts of interest. Uh, Steve Brandt, no new declarations. Jay? No new declarations for me. Jim? Uh, Jim Clore, no declarations. Virginia? No declarations. Joe? No declarations. Tanya? Tanya Heikla, no new declarations. Uh, Tom? Tom Holzer, no new declarations. Diane? Diane McKnight, no new declarations. Uh, Bob? Bob Nyman, no new, no new declarations. And Lisa. Lisa Wager, no new declarations. Okay, we will, uh, we have a quorum and uh, just, uh, I guess I need to read this in, a, in accordance with uh, federal, state and local guidelines to protect human public health and safety relative to COVID. We're running this meeting entirely via remote access. And on the screen is your, uh, uh, direct uh, instructions if you want to have written public comments or oral public comments. We will take uh, uh, written questions and comments and then email your comments to this particular uh, website here, disb at deltacouncil.ca.gov. And in your request, uh, please indicate the agenda item in which you would like your public comment read. And if you prefer to give an oral comment, uh, use the raised hand function in Zoom or send an email to the same address on, uh, on the particular agenda item in which you'd like to provide a public comment. And then afterwards, please uh, wait until you're prompted for the comment and then state your name and, uh, and affiliation. The uh, agenda today is to uh, uh, have a director's uh, report, then we'll move into a panel discussion on uh, new and exciting things relative to harmful algal blooms. And then we will talk specifically about the uh, Delta Science Needs Assessment and the outline is put that together and try and get your input on that and end up with talking about uh, future meetings and, uh, and format of future meetings and where we might go. So are there any public comments before I move on to item number two? There are none at this time. Thanks, Edmund. Okay. Uh, the chair's report, um, start off just reminding everybody uh, uh, about the current sort of curtailment of Delta Independent Science Board activities. As you all know, we are still in the process of uh, uh, moving from uh, no compensation to some uh, per diem compensation. Uh, that process is still underway. And uh, this overall compensation issue uh, is going to and has affected the activity level of the board, the number of meetings, the length of the meetings, and the amount of time people can put into the various uh, responsibilities we have. And this is gonna cause uh, fairly substantial delays in some of the, uh, our activities and, and uh, for us achieving our, our goals and agendas. So um, one of the things uh, that I wanna report on is that I sent with uh, at leadership sent uh, the council a memo last week asking for additional support to the board. And the idea is that recognizing that we are um, uh, not having as many hours devoted to, to board activities that we could use some senior staff level to support to help us with some of the reviews, do some of the things that maybe uh, routine things or specific things that the board members might uh, normally do. So we've asked for additional support and I'm waiting uh, an answer to that, uh, to that request. And the support uh, is needed for us to meet our legislative mandates and uh, state obligations and, and frankly, stakeholder expectations. The um, second item is just an update on the uh, ISB non-native species review. We've now received all the comments, I think for all the board members. And so that review is under uh, 
under revision and just to do the editing and, and comments. We will not change the content of it and hopefully have that available uh, early next year so that um, we can present the final recommendations uh, in a formal report to the uh, Delta Council on uh, in the February 25th and 6th meeting. The third item is that the Bay, uh, Bay Delta Science Conference is scheduled for April 6th and 9th. And we do plan to submit an abstract to that um, for the uh, invasive species or non-native species work we've done. Uh, Jay and I are also planning to submit an abstract to that conference for a special session related to the scientific needs assessment. And that would be a, a whole session on that particular topic, talking about the science as well as the management uh, scope of uh, related to the scientific needs assessment. And ESSA, the uh, group consulting group that did our monitoring inventory as part of our monitoring review, uh, is also planning to submit an abstract uh, uh, for uh, the conference on the work that they did on developing the monitoring inter inventory. Uh, some of the board members that were involved directly with that will also be uh, co-authors on that. Those abstracts, I think, I don't have the date in front of me, but it's, uh, I wanna say around the 26th of December, 28th of December for those abstracts. Of course, you all get copies when they when they go forward. Um, the, um, as I think some of you know, uh, the science program has been undergoing a, undertaking a review of the effectiveness of our reviews. That's been going on actually for a couple of years and um, now they've sent out, uh, the most recent thing is they sent out a survey uh, to look at the perceptions of the board, how well they use our reviews, what, what reviews, uh, uh, how perhaps our reviews might be able to be improved. I think all of you are aware, particularly the, the uh, I wanna say the non-new members of the board, that every time we talk about a review, we talk about how we can make it more effective. What can we do about the specific recommendations? Do we identify individual um, uh, groups that should be taken the action? Do we prioritize the recommendations? How do we communicate the results more effectively so that people can uh, uh, be more inclined to take our advice and, and take action on them? And uh, this review will uh, sort of be a sort of independent look at that and see if there are any lessons learned and ways that they can help us to, uh, to help us be more effective in, in what we do and more importantly, how it affects uh, people's actions down the road. You should have seen a survey, I think just in the last couple of days. Uh, you're all welcome to take that survey. Uh, and uh, if you like, and provide all the advice you would like us to take in the future. So uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, that's moving forward. Another uh, item, item to report on is that uh, the, um, to make all of the various, our various reviews and most of the products produced by the Delta Council and the program and, and the, uh, um, uh, and our board, uh, they needed to be made accessible. And in that process, our reviews were taken off the Delta Stewardship Council uh, website and were largely unavailable to the public without special uh, inquiries. So uh, Edmund has taken the lead and put those all back on. So on the Delta Stewardship Council in the proper format. So they are all available to you now on the Delta Stewardship Council if you ever wanna go back and look at some of the reviews we've done. Um, I think that's basically my uh, report. Any, any questions or comments before we move on? Okay, um, any public comment on my comments? There are none. Okay, thanks. Now we move on to fun. And uh, as uh, just for the interest of our, our two panelists, uh, what we've been doing over the last few months is we've been taking an hour and exploring a topic that we think is uh, might be of interest to uh, Delta decision makers, Delta managers, science, and where there might be an um, value in the Delta Science Board reviewing that topic. And so what we've been doing is asking panelists to come in and, and provide a, uh, uh, some background and some inspiration and, and uh, help lead a discussion on that. And it's, it's largely an exploratory discussion to see whether or not uh, further sort of in-depth analysis reviews and so forth might be something we might want to undertake. 
our reviews, when we do them, uh, uh, they're topical thematic reviews and they can take as long as a year. Sometimes I dare to say take two or three years uh, to complete. So they're a really a major effort. So we really appreciate, I wanna really thank uh, Peggy and Hans for um, um, joining us today. And I'm look, really looking forward to a stimulating uh, conversation and I'll turn it and I wanna thank Diane as well for uh, taking the lead and putting this uh, panel together. And uh, uh, Diane, I'll turn it over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, our topic is harmful algal blooms and uh, you use the word fun. Steve, I might say intriguing, perplexing and sobering all at the same time. Um, but uh, Edmund, if I could have the next uh, slide. Uh, we are, as Steve said, very fortunate to have um, two leaders in this area of hazardous algal blooms for our uh, panel discussion. Professor Hans Pearl is a distinguished scientist at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and has been studying the processes that drive algal blooms and their impacts for um, many years in a global context. And he has um, received numerous awards, including the Hutchinson Award from the Association of Limnology and Oceanography, and also the Odom Award from uh, the Estrin Research Federation. These are prominent names in ecology, aquatic ecology. And he is also a member of the um, American Geophysical Union, a fellow of the American Geophysical Union. Um, Dr. Peggy Lehman is from the California Department of Water Resources, and she ha has been a leader in studying these this topic in California and in, in the Bay Area. She received her PhD from the University of California, Davis, and has um, written a number of papers that are quite significant in terms of this phenomena. Um, I would like to reiterate that the purpose of this panel discussion is to inform the Delta Independent Science Board about the science questions and the dimensions of the impacts of uh, hazardous algal blooms. The next slide, please. Uh, and this is a slide I borrowed uh, from Professor Brandt that uh, summarizes some of the topics that will be discussed by our two panelists. There are numerous potential drivers for um, the growth of these hazardous algal blooms. And that's one quest set of questions. Another question is what controls the extent of toxin content in the algae themselves. And this can vary several orders of magnitude per gram of algal biomass. Uh, can I have the next slide? Uh, and here's a picture uh, from various websites of just how green this problem is. And I'd like to uh, give uh, more of a historical background. Uh, from the drinking water treatment perspective, the control of algal blooms has been a matter of uh, operational aspect for probably uh, 80, 90 years. And copper sulfate is a common approach to use low concentrations of copper to prevent the development of large amounts of algae in a water supply because that can give taste and odor problems that then cause the uh, public to complain to the water uh, treatment managers. So they that was avoided. And uh, so these were proactive measures when I was a graduate student back in the day, I was supported by the International Copper Research Association when I was a grad student at MIT to study the chemistry of copper and the sequence of blooms. But the point I'd like to make is that in this context of water treatment, the approach was to 
anticipate the bloom before it happened and uh, treat in order to avoid these conditions. So we have a much larger problem now where the challenge is to understand the drivers for these blooms to, in order to have any chance of anticipation and addressing those problems. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Professor Pearl to um, begin his talk. Mute myself. Okay, thank you, Diane. And uh, I just wanted to mention that I'm also a graduate of UC Davis. Uh, so you got you two UC Davis alumni going at it today. Uh, uh, and uh, Anyway, one or two, uh, actually, I think my first slide, I think you have to go back, Edmund, go back one more, here we go. Okay, uh, okay, my brief talk is gonna be about global, you know, the global sort of issues dealing with uh, cyanobacterial blooms. And I'm wearing my t-shirt today, my lab t-shirt, which uh, uh, basically tells it all, covers the earth. Uh, and I'm going to show you basically some places where blooms occur, and we know quite a bit about them. Uh, also, it might make you feel a little bit better about the Bay Delta when you see some of these systems. Uh, and I think that the real objective of my talk is to talk about drivers uh, of these blooms and what's, you know, how, how can we use these drivers, understanding these drivers to uh, come up with some sort of long-term control strategy that uh, deals with the issue of nutrient over-enrichment, but also climatic changes, which are playing kind of a synergistic role in the, in the development and proliferation of these blooms. So if I could have the next slide. Thank you. So here are the drivers. Uh, you can just go down the list here. You know, people have a lot to do with these blooms. And with more development, more people on Earth, we're getting more nutrients being released. Uh, increased nutrient inputs, both nitrogen and phosphorus, are responsible for these blooms. And we'll get into that a little bit more specifically in a minute. But also, water use and hydrologic modifications play huge roles. And those hydrologic modifications can be either human induced, like in reservoirs, for example, or damming rivers, but also with climatic changes that are taking place with more extreme uh, uh, rainfall events, but also more extreme droughts. So climate change plays a real interactive role. And the one thing we know about freshwater habs that often uh, mystify the marine people is that they are definitely increasing because there's a long history and long documentation of these blooms. Um, next slide. The other thing I wanted to mention is that these blooms are not just a freshwater issue. I think that up until maybe a, a decade or two ago, we thought, you know, this is really a lake problem, a freshwater problem. But it is expanding in estuaries, as we're seeing in the San Francisco Bay Delta area, but also other places. And I just show you three estuarine locations, uh, a Brazilian lagoon, the St. John's River in Florida, which is a tidal river, and then uh, Lake Pontchartrain off uh, New Orleans, all of which have microcystis blooms, by the way, in them. And then even in coastal waters and seas like the Baltic Sea, which has a long history of these blooms and also a long history of eutrophication. So don't think of it as just a freshwater problem. This can proliferate into marine environments as well uh, and many of us think that that will happen and is happening uh, as nutrient enrichment uh, proceeds. Next slide. Okay, so this is kind of the nitty gritty and this is kind of a pictorial version of what Steve's slide looked like. Uh, but I thought I'd sort of show you a, uh, maybe a kind of artsy ecosystem level uh, representation. So nutrients are an issue, obviously. Uh, much of it coming from agricultural, industrial, residential, and urban sources. Uh, when those nutrients get into a water body, uh, they can be utilized uh, by the phytoplankton and they're utilized differentially depending on the physics of that system. For example, in a uh, poorly mixed system, 
uh, cyanobacteria tend to win out in terms of being able to utilize those nutrients because they can uh, control their buoyancy and form surface blooms, uh, which of course take up all the light and can shade uh, plants, including attached plants underneath, and also cause uh, hypoxia problems, low oxygen problems, because there's no oxygen evolution going on underneath them. Uh, so they kind of run the show in these stratified systems. They come up during the day, do their photosynthesis, and then at night they can go down and get nutrients. And so they have figured it all out. Stratification is a big issue. The other big thing is residence time. So the flux of water through a system plays a very important role. It turns out that cyanobacteria are actually pretty slow growing compared to other phytoplankton uh, taxa. So in systems where you have high flow, uh, cyanobacteria often don't win out. You get other phytoplankton running the show, which are faster growing, like diatoms, for example. The uh, other, the, the, the sort of the uh, worst case scenario is if you have a wet uh, spring or wet period where you have nutrients coming into the system uh, and then it's followed by a drought so that the nutrients are then in the system and then the physics are allowed to take over and you get stratification and unless the system gets flushed uh, more often or, in, in, you know, or for longer periods of time, the cyanobacteria win out for the reasons that I've already uh, mentioned. The other thing is uh, food web issues with cyanobacterial blooms. Uh, many of them are not grazed effectively, certainly not by zooplankton. They could be, uh, end up in the microbial loop, but there can often be uh, sort of uh, choke points in terms of them being able to be grazed readily by uh, crustacean zooplankton and then go up to food web. So that's an issue too because if the bloom's accumulating and then it crashes, then you just get a lot of carbon that's going down to the sediments and not really being utilized in a food web context. Um, I think I'll stop there and go to the next slide because we'll come back to this in the end in terms of what can we do. Um, what I wanted to show you is sort of a worst case scenario that I've been working on for about 13 years now, um, and that is Lake Taihu in China which is a lake that changed over about three decades from a uh, desirable diatom dominated uh, oligo to mesotrophic lake to one that now looks like this. this. That's a remote sensing picture, true color picture of the blooms in Taihu. Taihu has been impacted by uh, severe development around it in the basin, including two large cities that you see there, uh, Wuxi and Suzhou. Uh, each one of them, by the way, has gone from about less than 1 million people to more than 7 million over the time that I've actually been there. Uh, so tremendous expansion of urban areas, but also agricultural that has led to more nutrient loads coming in. And you can see the results uh, of that. By the way, again, uh, microcystis dominated uh, system. So, um, and we'll get back to the microcystis issue, but one thing I wanted to, uh, emphasize is that microcystis is one of the cyanobacterial bloom formers that cannot fix nitrogen. And that's important because it depends on either external loads of nitrogen or regenerated nitrogen coming back into the system. So this brings into play the nitrogen question and we'll get back to that as well. Next slide. Okay, here in a nutshell is the nutrient problem in Taihu. It, it is sort of a, uh, how should I say it, exaggerated effect compared to other eutrophic lakes, but not all that different really in terms of the actual uh, dimensions of the, of the problem. So what you're looking at in that upper left-hand slide is the TN to TP ratio uh, in the lake over three years. And you can see that early in the year, there's a lot of nitrogen coming in uh, with spring rains and also fertilization of fields. Uh, the, the TN to TP ratio is huge. It's like 60 or even higher. Uh, and that red line, by the way, is the red field ratio. So that would be the ratio of balanced you know, nutrients that would be required for a good balanced situation of algal growth. So you can see that early in the spring, it exceeds the red field ratio by a lot. But then later in the summer, you can see it actually dips down below the, um, the, the ratio 
So from that, we formed a hypothesis pretty early on in a game that maybe the problem in Taihu is not just one nutrient, but both nutrients, because in the spring, you got excess nitrogen, so it's likely that phosphorus is limiting. But in the summer, you have what looks like dropping below red field, so nitrogen could be limiting in the summertime. Uh, and so the next slide, I think, uh, shows you sort of uh, what we have done to test this uh, hypothesis, and that is using bioassays. And these are uh, cubitane or bioassays that are suspended in the lake, so they're getting natural light and temperature. Uh, you can see there in the upper right, we actually have other uh, mesocosms that we're doing these experiments in too. But I'm just going to show you uh, the results of highly replicated microcosm experiments that we've done on the lake. So starting in spring, summer, fall, winter, and then the following year. And uh, initial is the uh, lake water sample in terms of uh, chlorophyll at the beginning of the bioassay. The control is the open uh, bar. And then you see nitrogen as the gray bar, phosphorus, and then N and P together. And what you can see is that indeed in the spring, phosphorus is the nutrient that stimulates production. That was during that high nitrogen load. But then in the summer, it shifts into a system where nitrogen additions become uh, more stimulatory. Uh, and if you look at the, uh, the two years, they're kind of different, although they show the same pattern. And I wanted to point out that this can change from year to year due to hydrology and how much loads the system is receiving from year to year. So that's a variable that needs to be looked at in terms of uh, ultimately establishing thresholds of nutrient limitation. But the bottom line is, and if you click on the, this one more time, the bottom line is that if you had N and P together, you get more than N alone or, or P alone. So yes, the lake is dual nutrient limited, but, if, but it looks like both nutrients really make a difference in the end in terms of enrichment and ultimately sustaining the bloom. Next slide. And this is my uh, politician slide for people that don't like to look at data. Uh, this is uh, uh, a 48 hour incubation of the bioassay. So the upper ones are the triplicate controls, uh, nitrate addition, phosphate addition, and N and P together. I think it's pretty clear evidence and I get a lot of nodding heads in China when I show this slide that both nitrogen and phosphorus are important in this uh, particular system. Next slide. So the question is, is Taihu just a really extreme kind of situation of these uh, cyanobacterial blooms or is it, can it be used as a looking glass for other systems? Uh, and we're gonna talk, just go through a few here. Uh, next slide. Lake Erie, everybody, of course, considers Lake Erie in the context of this because Lake Erie's had like two waves of these blooms. Back in the 60s, uh, there was already establishment of blooms mostly dominated by nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria. Uh, they imposed strong phosphorus reduction strategies and sure enough, the bloom got knocked back. Uh, most of those strategies, by the way, were point source reductions like wastewater treatment plants, uh, but the blooms have returned in the last decade or so, and they have shifted from nitrogen fixers to microcystis, non-nitrogen fixer. And so we're looking now beyond just P as a control because microcystis requires nitrogen. And if it's coming up like gangbusters, there must be a connection to nitrogen as well. And what we're finding in uh, more contemporary bioassays is that sure enough, nitrogen is uh, a key stimulatory nutrient for these blooms to develop in Erie, uh, but N and P together give you more than N alone, uh, which uh, you know hints at dual nutrient controls. Next slide. And uh, our bioassay results have been criticized by folks that do whole lake uh, fertilizations, and since I don't have whole lakes to fertilize. Um, I thought we would use some, look at some of that data actually from whole lake fertilization experiments that, ha, that have uh, gone eutrophic and developed these blooms. This is uh, data going back, or this is uh, from some papers that have been put together on this uh, 
Wayne Wurzbaugh and Bill Lewis were really instrumental in a lot of this stuff. But what you're looking at here are lakes that are mainly in the uh, temp north temperate uh, regions of the world, both in Europe and North America, including some very famous places like Lake 227, for example, in the ELA area. The bottom line is that if you add in, you actually, or you usually can get more stimulation just by adding N as opposed to P. But if you add N and P together, you get more than N and P alone. So these experiments are actually showing very similar results to what we see in short-term bioassays uh, that are executed in other places. Okay, next slide. And if we take a global, uh, oh, I'm sorry. So yeah, so this is from our ES&T paper, um, which I'm more than glad to send to folks. Uh, you know, takes two to tango, uh, N and P give you more than N alone and P alone. Next slide. And if we look at all the studies that I was able to gather, and many of these are, uh, you know, studies that have uh, summarized other experiments that have been done. These are sort of global examples of lakes and estuaries and um, other places, riverines, environments that all have cyanobacterial blooms on them and where bioassays have been run uh, or whole lake experiments have been run. And they show this dual nutrient limitation issue as well. Okay, next slide. So, uh, what can we do about all this? And this is really, I guess, what we're getting together for to discuss. Um, the bottom line is that um, there are a lot of ways of knocking back these blooms. Uh, Diane mentioned copper, but in uh, some reservoir situations, you can increase the flushing rates to reduce the residence time. You can enhance mixing using uh, uh, mixing devices. Uh, food web manipulations, although there's a lot of questions about those, ultrasonic treatment, upstream wetland development to try to reduce the inputs of nutrients, chemical treatments, including copper sulfate uh, and uh, hydrogen peroxide, for example, and encouraging competition by uh, having more desirable plants in the system. And then lastly, taking the nutrients out of the lake by dredging uh, and, uh, and even capping the sediments. Um, and so these are all strategies that have been used, but the bottom line is you're not gonna get anywhere unless there's some comprehensive nutrient input reduction at the same time. I think all of these other strategies will, uh, can work on the short term, but often you have to repeat them. And if, for example, in the case of copper additions, uh, you often have to repeat that kind of treatment uh, or copper sulfate, for example, to knock back the bloom. So you're really, you're really kind of chemically modifying the system um, that uh, you're trying to treat. And you're not really removing the nutrients. You can remove them by dredging, but that's a pretty radical step in most instances uh, because you're destroying the benthos. And depending on the size of the system, uh, it's often very impractical to, uh, to do that. Um, I only know of a few examples where dredging has really been successful, uh, um, only in a few cases in, in Sweden, for example, in very small lakes, but they had to be accompanied by also reducing inputs of nutrients at the same time. So uh, let's talk about California really quickly here. What can we do in California? Well, we can do all these things probably, except maybe increasing the flushing rate, right? Uh, given the competition for water. Uh, that would be a, a environmentally friendly way of dealing with it, but that's simply out of the question in California. So I, my suggestion is, uh, and, and we're actually testing this in China, is to develop nutrient input thresholds. That is reducing nutrients to a point where you actually can do something about reducing the bloom, even when all these other conditions are favorable, such as uh, warming, uh, long drought periods, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that without really facing the nutrient uh, reduction strategy, 
I think we're going to get recurring blooms, particularly under climatic change conditions where, you know, we have more extreme inputs of nutrients due to uh, high rainfall and high input and then followed by droughts. Um, without reducing nutrients, I think we're just going to be faced with this problem uh, more severely. And the last thing I wanted to mention is uh, the whole issue about NNP. Uh, it used to be back in the 50s and 60s that you could reduce phosphorus and get some responses in many of these systems in terms of uh, improving water quality and, and uh, knocking back the blooms. But one thing you have to remember is that we've now gone through in many instances, even a hundred years of accelerated phosphorus input to these systems. And the issue with phosphorus is that once it gets into a system, it doesn't go away. It's just cycling between the sediments and the water column. And unless you physically remove the phosphorus or cap it, and the capping, there's a lot of questions about that, by the way, um, you're faced with a phosphorus legacy in these systems. And that's, I think, one reason why nitrogen has become uh, an equally important nutrient to deal with. Because at least if you reduce the inputs of nitrogen and nitrogen fixation doesn't uh, make up for it, denitrification will allow nitrogen to be left from the system. So an additional strategy then is reduce nitrogen in addition, you know, hold the line on phosphorus inputs, but really have a uh, pretty aggressive uh, way of reducing nitrogen. And by that, I mean total nitrogen. And I think Peggy will talk about that a bit more uh, to really um, have a long-term strategy. And there are ways of trying to establish these thresholds. There are uh, nutrient dilution bioassays, for example, where we actually dilute out the nutrients instead of adding them. And, and we get to a point where we see that we are in fact uh, controlling the growth of the, of the bloom organisms. Uh, I'll be more than glad to provide information on the nutrient dilution bioassays, which we've used in Taihu to now establish what the threshold should be and how much the nutrients need to be reduced in order to actually get to some sort of a controllable uh, point. Uh, and those numbers often are not small. For example, in Taihu, uh, you know, 30 years of aggravated nutrient inputs have led to, um, you know, ex very excess nutrients in the lake. So for Taihu, for example, our nutrient dilution bioassays are showing that nitrogen is going to have to be reduced, the inputs of nitrogen will have to be reduced by about 50% for phosphorus, maybe 30 or so. So these are not small numbers, but, you know, that's, I think the reality we're facing with, you know, 100 years or more of just allowing nutrients to get into these systems. So I think I'll stop there. And uh, oh, let me just, uh, is there another, there's another couple of slides, I think one. Oh yeah, so recommendations. Got to reduce both N and P in most cases because of the P legacy issue. Uh, the nutrient bloom thresholds are likely to be specific for systems, but in many cases where we've tested them, uh, it looks like at least a 30% reduction should be targeted. Uh, we may need to reduce these inputs even more in a warmer, stormier world uh, because blooms like it hot, by the way, the cyanobacteria like really warm conditions and episodic events like Big storms followed by droughts uh, favor these blooms. And the input reductions need to be year round. Uh, that question gets asked of me all the time. Can we just reduce nitrogen in the spring and phosphorus in the summer? Well, you know, many of these systems have pretty long residence times. So reducing a nutrient for only a few months isn't gonna really uh, buy you much. And lastly, warmer, longer growing seasons. And this doesn't really apply to the Bay Delta, but you know, the ice goes off earlier and comes on later. So the window of opportunities for these blooms is expanding uh, globally, particularly in high latitude places. And if I could have the last slide. Uh, yeah, just wanted to, oops, no, go back one. I just wanted to thank my colleagues who have done a lot of work on this. Um, uh, both in the US, China, Europe, et cetera. And uh, without them, I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't be going very far in this, in this game. So I'll stop there and uh, leave some time for, for Peggy. Those are the players, by the way. Uh, 
which Peggy will talk about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm glad you left me a couple seconds there. <laughs> that was great, huh? That was really great talk. <laughs> um, I'll just go forward because I think we're running out of time here uh, and quickly kind of give you a, a, a summary of what's been happening in the San Francisco estuary. And um, from, from my perspective, um, in 1999, uh, we first saw the, the blooms come into the estuary. And at that time, all we saw on the water were these, these uh, colonies that looked like shredded lettuce. They were uh, quite spaced quite at distances and it, it didn't seem to be too big a problem. Uh, they could be aggregated with wind, et cetera. And on the left, you kind of see what, what those look like. So it wasn't a, a problem, but last year in um, 2020 uh, and in, some of the years, I have to admit, we've had these massive blooms, particularly in the harbor areas. But last year was the worst. Last year, the toxin concentrations got up to a thousand micrograms per liter of microcystins uh, at Stockton. And so this is a serious issue. This last year uh, was, was way beyond what we expected. Next slide. This bloom expansion, as I said, began in 1999, and it's been an incredible to watch this. First, we had microcystis aeruginosa, just microcystis aeruginosa. Then we had up to like 10 strains of that. I, think, I don't know how we have now, but up to 10. Then we had different microcystis species. Now we have a mixed cyanobacteria bloom, and that's basically what it is right now. Uh, it contains microcystis, of course, but also Dilchospermum, which, which is also known as Anabena, Afanazomenon. And in the, the mix out there, we have all kinds of things. We've got Oscillatoria and Numidia and, and Lingvia. There are a lot of other cyanos that, that could uh, bloom. Right now, these three are the, the main ones. Um, the toxins we have uh, have gone from microcystin exclusively now to, as uh, beginning in 2016, microcystins, anatoxins, and saxatoxins. So quite an expansion. And our bloom season was three, three months or so. Now it's seven months. And, and really it's because the temperatures have increased in the spring. So now it's seven months and we're still counting, uh, no telling how long these blooms can go. Um, usually the blooms start when water temperature comes about 19 degrees. And then the colonies go down to the bottom and stay on the sediments once the temperature reaches about 15. So in our case, we're starting to see these come up around uh, now June and in December, they still haven't gone down. So it's quite, a, quite an expansion. Um, they started initially in the San Joaquin River and then sometimes we see it's a soon bed and now we see it way in the Northern Estuary into the, into the floodplains uh, up there and in some of our uh, freshwater habitats uh, up in the, the northern pieces. Um, toxin concentrations used to be less than one micrograms per liter. Now, as I say, last year, it's up to a thousand micrograms per liter. So we're, we're really seeing a huge increase. Um, in terms of the reservoirs, the drinking water, um, usually it was less than one micrograms per liter, but now we're in the kind of a caution level uh, at times and places at two to eight micrograms per liter. So throughout the system, we're seeing these shifts um, in, in this, this microcystis, then it has been huge. Next slide. And uh, Janice Cook kindly gave me these data and I put these here for you. This is the, uh, the total microcystins concentration that they measured uh, last year. And you can see that we have these danger levels going up, as I said, to a thousand micrograms per liter. Um, in a number of places throughout the estuary, uh, particularly around Stockton, but uh, not only. Discovery Bay is a big area too. It's a big harbor area, but you can see uh, the potential for expansion throughout the system is large because it has so many places where we, we see these high levels. Next slide. What are the causes? Well, as Hans so beautifully showed, um, nutrient concentration is a huge issue. We have lots of nutrients in San Francisco estuary, a lot of nitrate, a lot of ammonium, a lot of phosphate. Uh, there's no, no limitation here. Um, the ammonium is important and there's a focus on that in the estuary, 
Um, my persistence grows really well on ammonium, very fast relatively to other species on the ammonium. Um, but it also grows on nitrate based upon our N15 studies. We know it'll use whatever nitrogen is available. So total, total loads are an issue here. Um, key to what's happened in the estuary, of course, is water temperature. Water temperature has, has increased. We're seeing temperatures in the, in the summer of 28 degrees in the water uh, centigrade. These, um, these cyanals grow really well at those temperatures, although I, I have a feeling that microsis is peaking out somewhere at 25, which is interesting. But basically, it's just fostering the blooms. And again, as, as Han said, long residence time and dry conditions, this is an issue for us. We have an index of residence time we call the X2 index and it, it, it uh, relates to the distance upstream from the Golden Gate where we see um, two parts per thousand salinity at the bottom. And when that, that distance is 85 kilometers or more, we see a lot of bloom in the system. And between water temperature and this residence time, we can describe about 80% of the variation of the is bloom at this time. As you can see on this figure on the right, multiple factors, the X2 index on the left and the water temperature on the right, we get above 85 uh, kilometers for our residence time index. And at 25 degrees is water temperature, we see peak um, microcystis uh, growth in the system based upon previously high, high year of 2014 and our low of 2017. As I said, that's, we can predict that pretty well with just a simple regression. Uh, one thing that's starting to become an issue here that we're, we're looking at now is our herbicides. Um, we did some work uh, in the laboratory looking at microcystis growth and um, some other phytoplanktons, the diatoms, et cetera, in response to um, some herbicides and one fluoridone, which um, was commonly used, uh, indicates that, that microcystis is less responsive to these, uh, to these herbicides than things like diatoms. And so um, the chemicals we put in the environment are really important. Uh, and and we, we have double evidence of that now from our recent work with the bacteria showing that uh, microcystis and the other cyanobacteria that are the dominants in the system co-vary with phenylobacterium. Phenylobacterium only occurs when you have a high uh, decomposition of um, these herbicides. So uh, we're seeing that, the, that perhaps these herbicides are contributing to the problem. Next slide. We got a question before we even began this uh, presentation about biological impacts, so I'm, I'm hitting it right here. Um, in terms of exposure, we have found microcystins in all the beasts of the estuary. Um, and there is a, a way that this moves up the system, and a very good one is, is um, demonstrated through thread fin shad. They are a common prey in the system, and they gobble microcystis. They love it, and their bellies can be distended with, with microcystis, and you can actually see green on the side because they have so much stuff in their tummy. And because they are a predator, um, a fish coming along and eating a thread fin will get a large dose of microcystin. So there is a lot of movement from the lower food web up uh, through predation. We know that microcystis affects the zooplankton, number of studies done in conjunction with Suite's lab at UC Davis. Well, we know that um, zooplankton, for instance, uh, increased mortality occurs uh, in response to uh, microcystins in the water column, and, and it varies among the species. For the fish, we've, we've done work with split tail, threadfin shad, delta smelt, all show responses to the presence of, of microcystis in, in their diet or in the water. And you can see, see here a threadfin shad, see how its musculature has changed when it's given a diet of, of, of microcystis. So uh, they do not do well um, on, on these uh, halves. Um, phytoplankton, we don't have any direct studies for this system. However, we do have a lot of field work and, and it shows that, that when we have the cyanobacteria, we have few diatoms and few greens, a lot of cryptophytes. So definitely there's a huge shift in the phytoplankton community. And bacteria, which we're now looking at a little bit, we found that if we have a microcystis bloom, we have a decreased bacterial diversity. And as I said before, increase in phenylbacterium, which is a, 
directly associated with uh, the inorganic byproducts of herbicide. Next slide. So what do we do now? Um, right now, given what we've had last year in 2020, uh, we need to focus on safety. People in this estuary could not even go out on the water with their boats. And we now know that there's even aerosol com component to microcystis. It is, is dangerous for people to be in the Delta. And this is a huge recreational area, huge fishing area. It's, it's a problem. Um, we can learn a lot from what's being done nationwide um, with some of the HABs, you know, they have along the coast. They're doing a lot of work with early warning systems. So they are focusing on things like in situ real time monitoring for toxins and species composition. That's gotten pretty sophisticated these days. You can have those systems out in the water and they can relay through satellite back to whatever computer system you want. Um, here, the ESPN, which does toxins, and the Cytobot, which does species. Now, these are becoming regular tools for, to use in things like, you know, the Karenia blooms out along the coast. And those may be the targets uh, we want to have for future uh, management here. I think, too, we, could, we have some great modelers in IEP, and forecast modeling would not be out of the, the realm of, of what we could do today. Uh, to take a look at, at figuring out how some of these nutrient concentrations, light conditions, temperature, et cetera, and flow would affect um, the blooms. And so we can give people an idea of what might be coming um, so that we can uh, help people um, protect themselves. Um, and key, I think here, and we have a long way to go here, is information transfer. Public should be able to, to find out what's going on immediately in the location they're, that they're at, um, and there's a lot of uh, information out there, a lot of tools out there from, from our colleagues who are looking at um, HABs along the coast. Uh, for instance, right here, I demonstrate there's, a, there's an app you can get on your cell phone and it'll download information straight from the satellite from, from a monitor in the system. So you can know if you're in a location where there's a HAB present. Um, and, and I think we can do a lot too to engage our citizens. We have a very active community in the Delta to help them uh, monitor uh, and cite for these where there is a good, good work being done now with the state board, but there's lots of tools out there, techniques uh, that are simple for them to use, sticks and small um, bio systems that they can use to, to help them know when they're in a safe place or not, and maybe help us uh, get greater information on the system. Um, on, on a you know on a local basis, so there's a lot we may need to do now, uh, right now, to help people be safe. Next slide. And what do we do over a long time? Well, it, as Han said, we have to reduce the nutrients in the system if you really want to control it. And you know, of course, we have to do our due diligence to try and minimize climate change impacts. The water temperature and the drought are hurting us. That's hard for us to change locally, and and I know. The nutrients is hard for us to change locally too because of all the farming we have. It's, it's really hard in those farmers to control their nutrients, the level we need because of the economics of the situation. So we have a, a tough road there and I have talked to a lot of farmers about this. This is, this is hard for them. Um, but you know, we, we also can take a look at some of those treatments. So there's a lot of allelopathic type treatments that people are looking at. Some of those might be useful for us. The big problem we have in the Delta is so big uh, that it's very hard to, to use some of these treatments, say some of the bubbling techniques or whatever, they only work in, in you know, small locations and we have very big problems. But there may be areas like marinas where we could focus, get these concentrations down to some of these small level treatments. But so we have a long way to go, but, but uh, I think we need to start um, focusing on, on this because of the, the danger to the public and the, the, the lack of our ability to use the system and the danger it proposes to the, the food web. Okay, that's, that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Hans and Peggy, for these very informative presentations. 
I think now we open this up for questions from the uh, Delta ISB members. Jim, please go first. Um, Peggy, can you tell us where the state of California sits right now in terms of discussions of the need to reduce nutrient inputs to the Delta? No, I can't. <laughs> No, I don't know. I mean, you know that the State Water Resource Control Board, you know, is is uh, talking about ammonium reductions, and uh, we have a you know programs uh, established right now to try and and get the ammonium down. Um, but total nutrient reduction that's really not on the table right now. It's more ammonium reduction through through. Um, control of what's happening with the, the uh, treatment plants. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that the level of, of nutrients that they're going to uh, affect in their treatments is going to be sufficient to really take out the microcystis blooms. Uh, their focus is a lot of ammonium and, and there's still going to be a lot of nitrogen left. So um, I, there, there's a, you know, a large uh, focus on that. They're, they're talking about it, but there's no, no fixed ratios, no fixed concentrations um, that have been decided as far as I know. Dave? Yeah, this is a, this may be a naive question, but it relates to food webs. I know in Lake Erie that uh, when the sort of the resurgence of microcystis came into the <clears throat> second wave, there was a lot of work and discussion about the impact of the zebra mussel that they had controlled and somehow altered the nutrient to phosphorus ratios and also had some uh, selective predation on, uh, on, um, uh, against microcystis. Is there any indication that uh, corbicula played a role or is playing a role at all in microcystis? And if not, are, are there any other food web implications we ought to be uh, thinking about? We don't. Uh, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Peggy. Well, well uh, locally, we don't have any studies that, that have looked at it. We do see, you know, the microcystins in the clams. So we knew they're, we know they're taking it in. Um, I don't know that they're having an effect in one way, in another they might. The, the one thing that, that they do influence is they uh, increase the water transparency. And microcystis does sit on the bottom of the water column, right? And, and as more light gets into the water column, it enhances microcystis' ability to grow, but also it increases the temperature of the water column. And I think that that could be enhancing uh, microcystis, but um, any other way, we haven't done any studies to, to verify any of that. Go ahead, Hans. Yeah, Steve, let me just add one uh, couple of uh, things. First of all, the blooms in Lake Erie, many of them are surface dwelling uh, blooms, or at least during most of the day they're at the surface. So they're kind of away from the gray, from the benthic grazers to begin with. And uh, if anything, I think uh, knowing how good microcystis is at, at utilizing reduced nitrogen and recycled nitrogen, I think if anything, the clams, you know, they may have actually uh, enhanced uh, the recycling rates, the internal recycling rates of both phosphorus and nitrogen in Erie. So my, and, and also this happens in other lakes too. For example, in Taihu, there, there's a lot of clams in Taihu. They, in fact, the uh, Chinese uh, fish them and eat them. Of course, I would never eat one of those, but they're supposed to be delicious, but anyway. Uh, maybe it's the microcystis that makes them taste good. But anyway, they have huge, the, the lake is covered, the bottom of the lake is covered by uh, uh, these giant freshwater clams. And it has, and you know, basically, uh, it seems like the impacts, if anything, might be positive as opposed to being uh, negative. Well, that's what I was thinking about in Lake Erie. It is a, uh, the zebra mussels promoted microcystis. It was an, it was yeah. an enhancement of it. Well, maybe. Yeah. I think the, I think the bigger issue is that for a long time, nobody paid any attention to nitrogen 
it was so phosphorus focused. And, you know, the watersheds around Erie are uh, heavily fertilized with chemical fertilizers, uh, as you know, uh, a lot of it for biofuel production. That's a whole other story, but uh, a lot of nitrogen leaking through the system now. And the fact that we're seeing more non-nitrogen fixers is really telling us uh, that, you know, the, the community structure has changed probably in response to the fact that there's more nitrogen available. And, and uh, the other uh, player in Lake Erie besides microcystis is uh, Plankthrix in uh, Sandusky Bay, for example, uh, which is also a non-nitrogen fixer. So my inclination is let's start worrying about what's coming in from the watershed. Uh, we can argue about the, I guess we can argue about the uh, zebra mussels for a long time, but I think they're kind of a secondary uh, modifier, maybe, of the community. So I have a question for Peggy or Hans. Of these different approaches, uh, given the importance uh, for control, given the importance of nitrogen uh, and the scale of the delta, do you think expansion of wetlands is one of the more pragmatic approaches that might uh, work? You want to go first, Peggy? Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, there are a lot of projects uh, really in the pipeline to expand the wetlands in the Delta. Um, so those may be helpful. Um, we'll see, time will tell on that. Um, there are problems expanding these wetlands, so we need to find the land and all that. It's it's not so easy, and and um, you know, with with the, the change in in climate, we're seeing a reduction in wetland habitats that, that are available. So it's 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 kind of tough. Um, but yes, the 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 plan is to do some expansion, and more expansion couldn't hurt. Um, it, you know, as far as I'm concerned, or what we know in general about wetlands, but but so far we, we don't have a lot um, on that. I think some of the work I've done with wetlands uh, does demonstrate there's quite a bit of um, processing of nutrients, so that's good. Certainly ammonium is immediately transferred to nitrate. Um, and you know, there's quite a bit of uptake, so it, it can't hurt, but I think we have to do more in-depth studies in the very few wetlands we have to work with to kind of understand what's needed and where it's needed. Yeah, I'm all in favor of wetlands. I think they're great, uh, not only in terms of removing nutrients, particularly nitrogen through the uh, coupled nitrification and denitrification. But um, the big question I think Peggy already mentioned it is probably land availability. So one thing that I wonder about is whether or not uh, some agricultural lands could be converted to wetlands. Uh, you know, we pay farmers not to grow crops for other reasons, uh, can we pay them to uh, have wetlands on their, you know, in their operation? Uh, that actually has been going on in North Carolina. Uh, the largest corporate farm east of the Mississippi is actually located in the county I live in, believe it or not. You can see it on the satellite photo, uh, Open Grounds Farm. They grow corn, cotton, uh, soybeans, you know, the usual stuff they grow here. Uh, but they actually have gotten, they have, they have dedicated some of their lands to treating nutrients through wetlands. And this has been a real success story, been able to reduce nitrogen uh, throughput uh, from their operation by 50%. So I think we got to start thinking creatively about this, you know, um, 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 if we even, like I said, if we pay, farmers not to grow crops, we can certainly pay them to do some innovative things with the land. The one question, of course, I have about wetlands in California is that the rain all comes at once, right? And uh, the rest of the time, there's no rain. In fact, you guys haven't even had any rain yet, right, for uh, this fall. Mm -hmm. So no that, rain so far. That's a consideration in terms of the operation of wetlands. Yeah, it's a real problem for us having water to make the wetland in the first place. Yeah. Like a wet. Yeah. 
Uh, Lisa? I'm not gonna get better. <laughs> so my question is, if we're trying to convince policymakers to uh, invest a lot in nutrient reductions, do we have any stories of how successfully reversible these HABs are through nutrient reductions? Do we have, do we have the evidence we need to build a quantitative model? Um, yes, the answer is it's, it's, it's well, th there's, there's been a phosphorus story for a long time, you know, successful re uh, reduction of phosphorus going all the way back to Tommy Edmondson's, you know, great uh, story about Lake Washington. But with nitrogen, we are starting to get some stories now that are success stories. For example, um, some of the tributaries along Chesapeake Bay, even here in North Carolina, the Noose River estuary where uh, TMDL is in place for reducing nitrogen, we actually are able to uh, reduce uh, chlorophyll um, content. And then there are some uh, good examples in Europe, uh, the Himmerfjorden, uh, which is a fjord that comes down from uh, Stockholm uh, into the Baltic. Uh, Ragnar Elmgren and his, uh, his colleagues have worked there for quite a long time and they've shown, uh, well, it's an interesting story there. They, they uh, you know, the Swedes reduced phosphorus a long time ago. They were way ahead of the game, uh, but they still had cyanobacterial blooms. So Ragnar said, well, you know, maybe we should do something about nitrogen. So they, um, they had they have one big wastewater treatment plant at the head of this um, fjord, and they convinced the city of Stockholm to go to denitrification, and uh, they've improved water quality tremendously in the Himmerfjorden. I can send you guys some literature on that, and um, if you'd like. And then in China, they are starting to uh, have some improvements uh, in places, including around Taihu, uh, where they have. Uh, converted farmland to uh, treat nitrogen in particular and have shown localized success stories, not in the open lake, but some of the bays around the lake by encouraging the growth of macrophytes uh, and again, enhancing denitrification. Um, I think wetlands are really good for nitrogen. They're, you know, they're really great for nitrogen. Uh, uh, phosphorus too, but you got to harvest you know, the stuff out of there to get rid of the phosphorus. So, you know, that could be an issue. So yes, there are, there are success stories that are evolving. Um, but, you know, linologists have only recently really started worrying about nitrogen. You know, it's like, uh, this paradigms are hard to break, <laughs> I've discovered. And, uh, <laughs> but it's happening. So I'll be glad to send you some stuff on that. Diana, in the interest of time, I might have to cut this off. Um, uh, we do have two public comments. Uh, I think this is a topic we're clearly going to continue to discuss, and we and uh, we also have it as one of our primary areas to look at in the science needs assessment. So um, let's move on to the public comments and ask each of those to identify. Uh, members to uh, Edmund will call them out and they can identify themselves and their affiliation and try and keep it to uh, three minutes. Okay, I'm gonna call Ray and in the order that I see them. First up will be Crystal Marino. Um, I'm gonna unmute you, so please um, unmute yourself when you're ready. Um, while we're waiting for Crystal, afterwards will be Eddie Hard, then Lindsay Camier from the Water Board. Um, Crystal, um, are you able to talk? We're um, not able to hear you at this point. Hello, Crystal. Um, I see your microphone is um, unmuted, but I'm not hearing you right now. Um, if you're open to it, Crystal. Um, oh, Hi, can you hello? hear me? Hello? Oh, yes, we can. Hi, so I um, think yes, that was can. a mistake. I, I didn't mean to raise my hand and I couldn't figure out how to get off mute. Okay, mm -hmm. Okay. thank you. Um, next up will be Eddie Hardman. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yep. 
Uh, my name is Eddie Hart. I'm with the California State Parks Division of Boating and Waterways. I had a question for Dr. Peggy Lehman on her slide addressing the causes of microcystis. Uh, and one of the oh. suggested what items in there was listed as uh, phenyl bacterium increases as a result of, uh, I guess the suggestion was SAV breakdown. And I was just curious if that result was, was done in a mesocosm or in, in situ. Right. We just recently uh, finished some work, uh, uh, and hopefully it will be out soon, um, looking at the communities uh, of microcystis, um, uh, both phytoplankton and bacteria. Uh, we looked at 2014 through 2018, and these are all field studies. And uh, in those, those data, what we found is that the association between phenylobacterium and uh, microcystis and other cyanobacteria was extremely strong um, over those, those five years. So um, uh, knowing what we know about um, the relationship between um, some of the uh, herbicides, in particular, a study we did with uh, fluoridone and we, we know that, that microcystis um, doesn't respond to fluoridone as much as diatoms do. And that's been published, uh, Kelsey Lamb, we got that out last year. Um, uh, so to me, seeing a phenylobacterium associate so closely with microcystis um, uh, tells me uh, that there may be a connection there with the, the herbicides. And uh, beyond that, I can't make any statement. It, beyond the work that we did in the laboratory, looking at the relationship between herbicides and microcystis and some of the other phytoplankton. So, very um, good. Would be yeah. more than happy to work with uh, anyone to do an in situ study on this. Right. That sounds great, Eddie. I I, I think you know uh, that those sorts of things uh, would be useful. I think okay. we need to understand what those herbicides are really doing. Um, you know, I, and I know some other work, but I want to mention it, but definitely which herbicide is used, it makes a huge difference on the communities um, that are there. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you. Um, just, so we, just so you know, Steve, we also have two more, um, two additional folks by email who also want, want to provide public comments. Um, so it, it'll be fall after Lindsay, we'll go to Barbara, then Linda Smith from Metropolitan. So, and Barbara um, Kerrigan Perilla from Restored Delta. Um, so Lindsay, if you still have a question, um, you're up next. Hi, Lin I'm Lindsay Kamier from the State Water Resources Control Board. Do you still have a question or comment? Awesome. Um, if not, let's move on to Barbara Perrigan Perilla from Restore the Delta. Um, Barbara, if you're on the phone, because I don't see you on um, right now, can you press star nine? I am not on the phone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I want to thank this panel for their work that they're doing. On, the, on HABs, and I want to say uh, great thanks to Dr. Lehman and, Do and Dr. Parle. Um, the work that everything you're talking about today is so relevant to what we are living through in the Delta. Restore the Delta has secured a grant to begin working on a youth science training and communication plan for tracking HABs. In the Delta, we will be looking to and receiving guidance um, from the state water boards. We also have a more substantial grant pending for this work. Um, it's been an 18 month struggle for us to get the funding, but our intent is to train just a small uh, uh, battalion of um, high school and college students to begin tracking, testing waters and reporting to the water boards what is happening in the Delta with HABs starting in San Joaquin County. Our ultimate goal is to certify um, 
uh, becomes uh, a certified citizen science program, and then to replicate what we're able to do with partners in other parts of the Delta. Um, as we've seen with COVID, you can't really solve or mitigate um, what you don't have uh, full capacity to track and identify. And so this, this idea of tracking and identifying and Dr. Lehman's comments about Stockton today were so relevant. Uh, there's a topic um, you know, that I just want your agencies, your programs and your research to think about. There really has to be a strengthening in the connection between your research and engaging public and health, uh, public health and safety agencies in the at the county level in the Delta. And it's not only to understand the science, but to really develop a timely and proper public response. Uh, I had provided some photos. I don't see them. It's not important right now. Uh, Dr. Lehman and I had some of the same photos from. Um, oh, there they are. Um, some of the same photos from uh, Stockton this year. You, you can see this is really grassroots work because my thumb is one is in one of the photos. Um, but what was so problematic and has been problematic the last two years is that we cannot get county health departments to get signage up quickly. We know that we have homeless people using these polluted waters with HABs in them for sanitation. We know that people's pets are dying. Um, I, when I've been out taking photographs this summer because we have not had a full on communication plan about how dangerous these waterways are, I was literally running around during this pandemic with the masks, trying to wave people out of the waterways. I was watching people launch in boats with toddlers, not properly prepared. I've had people drive up uh, when I've been out off their jet skis through these waterways. Um, so we, we are not anywhere near where we should be with a public response. And I do understand that our health departments and our emergency and environmental service departments have been under great stress with COVID, but we, we really need to put a long-term response in place as we work to uh, track and mitigate um, this plan. And then my last piece here today about, you know, public need and Delta need, I understand and, you know, accept what I'm hearing about the need for wetlands to replace farmland to mitigate this you know, there may be other benefits with sea level rise as well. But I have one question because, you know, in the Delta, when you always address one problem, you have another problem in another area. It's also my understanding though, that wetlands may actually increase the methylization of mercury, which is a whole nother problem. So all I'm asking or hoping is that there's a total picture uh, put together maybe on, on the benefits. And if we're working to solve one problem, how are we gonna make sure another problem isn't going to worsen? So thank you again for the opportunity to speak and for the work in the science. We use it as our guidance at Restore the Delta and try to match up what we learn from you with what we physically observe on the ground. Thanks a lot, uh, very helpful. Edmund, who's next? And our final one is um, Linda Smith from Metropolitan. <laughs> Um, Linda, are you on? Um, we also had another raise hand from Elaine Lapson. Um, so we're, we don't hear from um, Linda. Maybe we move on to Elaine. Oh, I'm sorry. This is Linda. I um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Yes, and I. this comment will be very brief. I just wanted to say two things. First of all, thank you um, very much for your focus on this topic. I think this is extremely important for the Delta and a, a great topic for the Delta Independent Science Board to dive into. Um, I know there are other meetings going on today that are conflicting with the ISB, and so there may not be folks um, able to join from the regional water board. But it, in respect to some of the questions that were asked earlier about programs in place 
for addressing uh, nutrients reductions. Um, there, there is activity at the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board, and I am sure that the staff there could provide information regarding both uh, planned upgrades that are underway at the wastewater treatment plants and what nutrient reductions would be expected from those. Um, that would be including uh, the Sacramento Regional County Sanitation District and also Stockton's wastewater treatment plant. And then also about, they could also provide you with information on activities to address non-point source and agricultural sources of nutrients, which of course is, is um, much more complicated. Um, but I, so I just wanted to let you know that. And um, while I'm not the source of the information, I am very aware that that information exists and, and I'm sure it could be provided for your use. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Elaine? Hi, are you able to hear me? Yes. yes. Awesome. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Elaine Lobson. I'm the Health Equity Director at Little Manila Rising in Stockton. I currently oversee our asthma mitigation work as well as our environmental justice work related to air quality and uh, our AB 617 work. Um, I'm also uh, combining some of my public comments with one of our youth uh, who could not uh, be here at the meeting um, because they have class. Uh, but just wanted to provide some background of our organization. Uh, we first started off in historic preservation, saving the last three buildings of the Little Manila Manila um, area, a Filipino community that was once home to the largest community of Filipinos outside of the Philippines from the 1920s to the 1960s, only to be demolished by the building of the Crosstown Freeway. And so for over past uh, 20 years, we have been engaged with our South Stockton community, teaching the history of our people to the next generation of leaders through ethnic studies, social justice, advocacy, and community building. And from the environmental justice and public health perspective, our Little Manila historic site is also in the 100th uh, percentile in asthma related issues um, in all of the state of California. These are the present effects of building a busy freeway through the homes and businesses of a community. It is also an issue we are extremely sensitive to since we lost our co-founder, Dr. Dama Ballin at the young age of 46 to an asthma attack. Poor air quality is something that is not new to our work in Stockton, especially as we understand it is more intensified by the pollution burdens of the Port of Stockton and other industries. However, it's not too far away from the site of our Stockton's waterways filled with tabs uh, that are contributing to our poor air quality. Um, and over the summer, we worked with our youth advocates from uh, high school age up to college age participants. And during a field observation in partnership partnership with Restored Delta, some of our youth noticed the waters in the downtown area and saw a tense amount of HABs um, as we were investigating uh, more of the uh, industries and companies that were emitting uh, toxic air pollutants uh, to the community of Stockton. Um, and so uh, a question uh, for a follow-up is uh, really trying to understand like, is will there be like more further investigation testing needed resources to help clean our waters as our youth um, who are the ones who are observing these um, and are there any ways to uh, also get them involved in this process? Thank you. Uh, thanks Elaine for those uh, comments. Uh, part of our job here is to uh, explore the, uh, the science and management needs relative to this question and, I, and we will be talking about this topic uh, uh, down in the future, I think. Are there any more uh, public comments, Edmund? Um, there are none. Well, I'm, I'm, I really hate to cut this off. We're kind of over time, and I know Diane has to leave in a few minutes. And uh, so um, I think, uh, I mean, this has been a very exciting topic. And judging by the number of public comments we had, which is quite a few for, for our board and over 70 participants, which is a very large number for us, I sense in the, in the community as well, amongst the stakeholders, there's a lot of interest in this topic. And I really want to thank... Uh, Diane and Hans and Peggy for really uh, stimulating this conversation. We hope we can uh, tap on you again as we uh, as we continue to explore uh, this issue. Okay, well, thanks everyone. And I think we'll uh, move on to the uh, next topic. Uh, Jay, as a time check, uh, can you do this in 20 minutes? I think so. I think we have to. <laughs> Um, so all, all of the board members should have a, some early notes um, and an outline of a science needs assessment for the Delta. This is, I think, a 
rare opportunity for us to take a look at the big picture of Delta science and, and the long picture of, of is the entire science enterprise well organized and well positioned to prepare, to help prepare um, the Delta for some of the really major changes that are, are going to happen. And in, in fact, are already starting to happen for the Delta. Um, it was a concern of the science board uh, when we met on this uh, originally uh, almost two years ago now, a year or so ago now, that, uh, that we had some worries that, that we were ready for, uh, organized for the science to, to basically inform and prepare the decision makers and the planners and the policy makers for the kinds of problems that the Delta is likely to face in the coming years. Um, and so now we're, we're trying to uh, have a process and a, and a document in the end uh, with the science board being the primary leader of this effort to, um, to try to move things along, hopefully in a better way. So uh, we really look forward to all your feedback on this document and the notes on it, outlines. Um, if I, I realize that this is the first time that most of you will have seen this, particularly the new board members. So um, if you have any questions now, I think that's probably the best way to start the discussion. I could I can briefly go through the outline on the first page if that's if you would like, but um, I want to make sure we have time for some comments. Okay. I've noticed that, that, that Virginia has already done a wonderful thing. She's she's going to be able to replace me as the compulsive editor of documents on the board. So I'm, I'm really delighted with that. Tanya, you had a question, had a comment. So, kind of what, given the stage that this is in, what kind of level of feedback are you looking for today versus kind of written feedback? How would you, what's most useful from us at this point? Well, since this is the first time you've, you've seen it, I think, you know, I, we want to see your, your, your more strategic thinking on this at this point. Um, does this seem like it's going in a useful direction? Are there some really excellent examples that, that we've missed? Of, of places that have either done this kind of scientific needs assessment or have made good use of it in the, you know, in, in other places. Um, th th this is a pretty broad scale kind of, of uh, comment and document. Um, we need to keep it fairly short to be, uh, have impact at the policy level. So uh, at, at this point, I think we're mostly interested in your strategic thoughts. Virginia. Um so given the comments we just heard about um, the blooms, I think under 2D, when we ask about the gaps in science expertise and organization, it's important to talk about uh, gaps in stakeholder engagement and in communication. Um, and some of the speakers earlier gave us several ideas on how we can do that. Yeah, that, that's really great. And I, I saw you it's also in your Thank you. Thank you. Jim? Um, Jay, this is the first that we've seen this document. And um, I know you all have put a lot of thought and time into this, th this subject. I have three kind of high level reactions to this outline. So if you don't mind. Go ahead. Okay. So the first is um, the way this document is written, it seems to be based on an expectation that the pace of change is accelerating. And I'm not sure that this is true. Um, I'd like, I, I'd be interested in know, seeing what kinds of data or evidence support that expectation. Um, I mean, that the Delta was transformed in the 19th century and it's been in a continual state of fast paced change at least since we started making measurements in the 1960s. I mean, the Delta is a very different place now than it was then everything from sediment supply to inflows to morphometry and water quality and biological communities. So I think it might make more sense to frame this around the expectation that changes will continue into the future, but the drivers of change will evolve like they always have. And that's a way to frame the, the challenge of climate change. So that was reaction number one. Um, reaction number two is that a lot of the content and vision in this outline is is contained in the Delta Science Plan. I mean, the Delta Science Plan's opening words are 
the only thing that is constant is change. Um, and its science action agenda was put together with a lot of a lot of interactions with stakeholders to find out what their priorities are. And I think the Delta Science Program Science Action Agenda is a form of a science needs assessment. So my, my, my recommendation is that this document will be, will be well served if you carve out what's new here and explain how it builds on previous visions of science needs. And then the third comment that I have is um, this outline is a call for forward looking science and it can give some readers the impression that this will be a new focus or a new direction of Delta science. But there really has been and continues to be substantial effort put into forward looking science. So my suggestion is that this document could be most useful if it is a synthesis of past and ongoing forward-looking science with an explanation of its policy relevance and identification of, of gaps in forward-looking science. So as examples, I'm not aware of much forward-looking science on the effects of population growth, for example, or the effects of wildfires on water quality or the outcomes of habitat restoration. So I don't think we need to convince anybody that it's important to do forward-looking science. I think the community would be better served if we do a synthesis of what, where we are right now in terms of forward-looking science and what, it, what its implications are for management decisions. So with this last comment in mind about synthesizing forward-looking science that's been done and is being done in the Delta, we could use the next six or seven or eight of our meetings to learn about forward-looking science as a step towards this synthesis. So I don't know if you wanna hear my thoughts about how we can do that now or later in our meeting when we, when we talk about future meetings. But I think, that, I think that we could use a number of our future meetings to, to flesh out this, this, um, this outline. And make that sounds it like a very in data as well as useful we thing to do. Do you wanna yeah. lay those out now? I'd like to comment a little bit on Jim's comments. Um, thanks, Jim, those are very helpful. I, I think part of the background on this in terms of looking at the rapid uh, change aspect of it uh, is something we, uh, gosh, I'd say at least a year ago, spent quite a bit of time on. We had uh, a series of panels uh, discussing this topic and, um, and uh, they all had input to a paper, a white paper that's now been submitted and, and is in the revision on this topic. And it talks about forward-looking science um, um, in a, and using a couple of specific uh, approaches about how to do uh, forward-looking science in that. I, I don't know if that has been made available to the, uh, to the board, but Edmund, it should be made available. I, I think we sent a draft version of that that white paper uh, around. That sort of explains the rationale. And of course, a lot of it is sort of the expectation that the changes are gonna come, the, ch the major changes in drivers are coming down the road as part of a leading uh, premise. I think the, uh, we've had a lot of discussions too about how this fits in with other ongoing precedent setting uh, uh, or as a priority setting activities, including the science action agenda. And I think the difference we have here is that uh, we are taking it in the context that you have. I'm really looking at it in the context of a uh, changing ecosystem. We're looking at it in a context that goes beyond something that uh, any one agency that can do or any one agency can do within a matter of five years, which is the framework of the science action agenda. In fact, the original title on here, uh, which I think has been changed in the last few days is agency spanning priorities. So one thing that would set it aside, these are things that absolutely require multiple agencies and multiple disciplines to work together in order to achieve the science. Uh, so it cannot be done with any one discipline, with any one uh, agency. And, and that sort of sets it a little bit of a side or at least sets a, uh, some bounds on the type of things we're, uh, we're talking about in terms of uh, moving forward. And it was our hope that the kind of priority areas we're talking about are, are would demonstrate those kinds of um, need for agency spanning priorities, like doing a harmful algal bloom uh, forecast, 
which requires everything from meteorologists to hydrodynamics people to, to uh, nutrients, water quality, flow rate, and, and food web folks to get together to be able to make a forecast like that. And it's sort of at that level of scale, uh, I think we're talking about in terms of our, uh, of our priorities. I'd have to agree with, with Jim in, in, in saying that the Delta has always been a highly changeable place. You know, going back 6,000 years, you know, to sea level rise starting to drown the confluence. But I think what, what we see here is the kinds of changes that we're seeing are also changing. <laughs> that we're seeing changes in temperatures and, and um, ecosystems and, and changes in infrastructure that we haven't seen for quite a few decades. And we're likely to see some more of these. Uh, and, and I institutionally, as we look at the organization of science for this system, the science for the system tend to build around the institutions, the particular agencies, and particular agencies have particular missions which go around past perceptions of the problem. And we're seeing more of our newer problems, same pace of change, but a different kinds of change. And more of these kinds of change cause problems that span the existing agencies. And is the science that's organized primarily by individual agencies serving these problems, which now increasingly span agencies uh, sufficiently? So, so this is a governance th thing, and this is the governance I, I think challenge. In the end it will have some significant governance, but I, I think it would, should have more than that as well. Mm -hmm. Tanya? Yeah, well, I guess kind of related to that point, um, when I read through this kind of initial draft, and I, I realize it's a it's a rough draft, um, I felt a little bit of a tension in, in the draft as to kind of what the articulation of the problem is. Um, that you know, we're trying to solve here. And so I think there's this coordination challenge, which you just articulated very well, Jay, of you know, we, there's a lot of uh, fragmentation in how science occurs. And for a lot of these problems, because they sp span multiple fragmented institutional arrangements, we have to find ways to better, better coordinate those. Um, but there's also this idea that we need to that there's this forward-looking science that we need to be doing. And, and I was, as I was reading through the kind of the introduction, I felt like there is there were some claims in, in the draft report that, well, we do know that these things are coming. So there is clearly science that's telling us what some of these forward-looking problems are. And we have a pretty good idea of some of these problems and we've laid them out or someone's laid them out in this report. Um, so I guess, it seems to me that the, the, the bigger problem here is potentially this coordination and institutional governance problem, um, less so than do we understand, well, of course, we, there's uncertainties that we don't understand and we need to have a scientific structure and institutional arrangement to, to address those. But um, th just the, that problem statement wasn't quite settling for me, I guess. Um, you know, what we don't know and what we need to know and what the what the challenges are kind of institutionally. So I I won't belabor it, but there's some points I could just flag in the report that maybe we could sharpen. I, I think you're quite right in that there's not a complete agreement on what the problem is among the people that are working on this document. But but you know to go to your point and, and Virginia's point about um, communication, you know, part of the problem is that the fragmented organization of the science and conduct of the science is also hindering, I think, the diffusion and the synthesis of the science across the organizations and, the, you know, with communication to the broader policy and public community as well. And it, it might help to have some more concrete examples of where that's been a problem, perhaps. Yeah. That's, I, I know you want to keep it short, but there could be areas yeah. where you could kind of in there too. You're right. I really recognized a lot of these problems uh, from my work, both in the Chesapeake Bay program and from recent looking at the status of ecosystem-based management. So if you, if you think about ecosystem-based management being the a way that some people imagine forward-looking system-based, you know, problem solving, 
you can look at the problems that that has had as, as, as an example of what I think you're laying out here. It's that people don't necessarily have access to the information they need. There are institutional impediments to efficient solutions and, uh, and, and a lot of politicians don't really like to think long-term. <laughs> so uh, so I, I, to me, it actually really resonated the problems you're, you're bringing up. Um, uh, I would suggest that some ways that this could be helped would be uh, focus on not just in institutional problems, but incentives to cause them to work together. Because like EBM, as an example, there was lots of national level funding, federal funding to put together commissions and think about the problem across agencies, that was insufficient. <laughs> what was, there, was, there was a statement in there about something was insufficiently successful. <laughs> and so yeah, I would say EBM was insufficiently successful in making institutional change. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think as an economist, I always think about incentives, you know, we need to change the incentives of the agencies, you know, they have their regulations and missions they're operating under, they don't have incentive to go beyond that. So I, I think there's, and I'm sure Tanya has some great thoughts on some things like this. Um, the other thing I would suggest is that we think more about maybe creating tools that enable access to science or, or solve this problem of more systemic ways to think about problems. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe we're talking about a modeling framework. Maybe, you know, we could think about, you know, what is a, what is a tool that forwards some of these goals or, um, you know, are there examples we can draw from that have been successful? Those were just two thoughts I had. I, I, I would rather spend some more time with the document and maybe edit it, but. That, that sounds wonderful. These are all great comments, very useful. And, and, and please, as you go through the document, take lots of, lots of cryptic and, and thoughtful notes, uh, whatever you can manage uh, and send them on to me because those written comments always uh, penetrate more deeply. Um, I just want to build on what Lisa said, because I don't know if it's true here, but another system I worked in, the laws were actually a disincentive to have people work together, and maybe the regulations are the same, and I don't know if you want to tackle that head on, but I know the environmental lawyers in the system I worked in were really frustrated because they did want to take an environmental uh, and a holistic ecosystem approach, and the science was stymied by people in, in their um, different pillars. And so that's a governance issue, uh, but it's it's also this legal issue, if, if it is a deal for the Delta, which I suspect it is. And just to make a comment that uh, certainly it's, it's a nice document, but all the problems listed that are in broad sense, we have seen, as, as mentioned, uh, these are general problems all over, but maybe we want to be more Delta specific what are the science needs? So within that broad framework, we might want to somewhat identify issues that are specific that we want to accelerate that type of science development. So that might be of use, I think. Thank you, Joe. Any other comments, questions? I realize you haven't had a lot of time to look at this. And if, if you have some time, uh, please, over the coming weeks, um, send me send, send Edmund comments and that he will forward them on to me. Um, and, and then I will try to revise this document uh, early, you know, at the beginning of the new year. Yeah, let me uh, suggest also that you might think about it from two different ways. Uh, the first is, you know, we, uh, we, the board, triggered this effort by sending a memo to DPIC. The actual memo subject was urgency and opportunities for improving Delta interagency science and technology integration. So you're very right that a big motivation of this was that um, governance issue, the integration, the, the how do we move forward to get those more uh, collaborative efforts going to address the big issues. And this particular report, uh, we'll summarize that effort and we're hoping to finish that in early next year sometime, early being anything before 2021. And uh, <laughs> <I'm fine too. laughs> but, uh, yeah, <laughs> but then there's a second way to think about it, kind of like Jim was starting to take off on is that are there things, you know, we are going to, this is a joint effort between DPIC and us with input from the program and, 
and uh, council and of course, tons of stakeholders we had over the four discussion groups, 100 participants on each time. So that's a, this will come in as a report, it'll go directly to DPIC. And so the second way to think about it is are there things in here that we as a board want to uh, take on? Is there something in here that we wanna pursue more deeply, more broadly? Uh, and if it's a matter of uh, forward-looking science as suggested by Jim, or if it's some topics in here that we think uh, might be topics that we would wanna take on as a review uh, to dive in more, more deeply. Maybe it is forward-looking science, maybe it's harmful bloom forecasting, which is one of the things in here. And anyway, so think about it from that perspective too, because uh, it may be valuable for us, because once we submit it, it's up to others to take action. And, uh, but we also have the opportunity to take action and do something as a board uh, in terms of the science component of it in particular to move forward. So think about that more broadly, if you don't mind. Jay, anything else? Um, Jim, you, you had some thoughts about different areas that we could um, have some further discussions, symposia, workshops on. It, maybe maybe the thing to do would be to put those in writing and, and then we can circulate them around just in the interest of time today. But I certainly don't want to lose those thoughts. Um, and I, again, encourage everyone to, to get us some written feedback. Um, are, there, are there public comments, uh, Edmund? There are none. Okay. So, so Steve, we can continue here on this, or I'm not sure how much time you want to reserve for um, the ending materials for the meeting. Oh, well, we're pretty much uh, right on time. If we uh, okay. good, see, so, yeah, it can be done in 20 minutes. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to item five, which is preparation for upcoming board meetings. We have a meeting scheduled in January, and some of the things we thought about for our January meeting, one is to have uh, Laura Larson, who's the new uh, Delta Science Program Lead, she will be coming on full time at that stage and uh, to hear her vision of what she, where she wants to take the Delta Science Program. It's also the beginning of a new year. We haven't heard from the uh, Delta Stewardship Council Chair or Executive Officer recently, so have them uh, give a presentation on uh, what their upcoming plans for the year are, and if, particularly if there's anything and any requests they may have from the board. For the new board members, normally we have the science lead and the council chair present at every one of our meetings, but we haven't heard from them in a while. So this is the beginning of the new year and they can give more of an extended annual perspective on, on where they wanna go. And then the sort of the review process to look at is we're gonna look at the uh, monitoring enterprise review. We've asked uh, Vince Resch, who's been the lead in that program to come back and he's agreed to and uh, kind of summarize from his perspective where the monitoring review is, give us a background on it and where it needs to go. One of the things we'll be looking for is we, we, we put so much effort into it, we don't wanna let this review die. And uh, there is a tremendous amount of money into it as well. So we're looking for, um, couple of board members to step up and kind of take the lead and taking it to the next steps. As I said earlier, I did ask for support. If we get some additional senior level support or re-prioritize our current support, it would be hopeful that uh, one or more people could help us do that review, do the legwork of do, maybe even doing the interviews, we, which is what we had planned next, or, or doing some analysis of the inventory database for us so that we as board members aren't doing that, but we have a closely uh, uh, helpful senior person doing that stuff for us to move us along in that. So that's just a thought to think ahead of that. The, um, so that would be January. And then um, the rest of the month, we all already have scheduled the February meeting in a timeline, but for, for meetings next year, I think we, we might, now that we know what the per diem kind of situation is, we might want to continue to rethink about how we want to do our meetings. Do we want to continue the way it is at two hours? Do we want to have um, some more focused meeting, additional meetings? Do we want to have one meeting that's administrative and a couple of meetings talking science? Um, how do we want to move forward? And uh, my own feeling is that 
the two hours per month is minimal and uh and somehow we need to go on and move beyond that i've put together a list of things i think we as a board need to move forward with um in in my request for staff and uh, uh a number of things a number of our ongoing reviews and information flow and communication and a variety of things like that as well as further um uh, investigation into some of the topic areas that we've already looked at if we want to move forward on food webs or habs or things like that that uh, there's probably a next step to start doing the literature review and seeing what's available things like that again staff or board can take on, that on but um, any thoughts about where how we how we're doing how should we move forward in terms of meetings meeting frequency length topics Okay, so I'm going to propose we meet every day for 15 minutes, and uh, so you can all claim your per diem, and uh, we have to, have a, have to have a quorum. Okay, well then, if there's any counter ideas. Uh, well, I would say um, for any one day, Zoom of up to two hours is about the max I can stand for a Zoom without going crazy. So let's not have more than a two hour Zoom. And uh, I think it is reasonable to have uh, more than one of these a month. So the number I'm not sure of, but, but it's hard to be, um, follow the continuity of ideas when we have to get out and then get back in. And, and I think also as, as we start biting, biting into the meat of these issues, there will be time that is not just the meetings where we actually have to do work. Most of the work on these reports is, you know, 90%, 95% done outside of official board meetings. We've done a preliminary analysis of the uh, activities of, um, Pat, uh, of the board over three years prior to uh, this past year and to see uh, how many hours were put in and what, what proportion of time was uh, done in various level activities. And about 20% of the, on average over three years for over 10 board members, about 20% of the time was uh, participating in board meetings. Uh, and that means 80% were doing other things. The vast majority at 30 to 40% was in uh, writing and uh, reviewing literature and writing and another maybe 20% in, in reading materials and getting prepared for meetings. So the board meetings themselves historically have only taken up about 20% of uh, people's times. And those are the days when we were running eight hour board meetings or, or two day meetings. I don't know if I, this is a helpful suggestion or not, but I have a question and that is, you know, what does it look like for us to be able to get something done given the modest amount of effort, right? So we have these ongoing reports that you wanna not lose sight of, but it, in terms of the best way to use these meetings, I'm just trying to think, um, like this was very helpful, like for the science needs to just get get lots of different perspectives. And so now we could go back with, uh, with that thinking and, and, and maybe think some more, but um, I don't know. I feel like maybe the chunks of what we should bite off maybe should be different. I, I don't have a solution here. I just feel like I don't want to feel like I'm constantly just making these mild contributions that don't really get us all the way down the down the field. I think historically the way the, the group has worked is smaller groups of us have focused on particular reviews, particular products worked outside of the meetings by and large to produce things that then come before the larger group meetings and, and are reviewed outside of the um, public meetings um, in written form. You know, that, that would imply that we would probably break ourselves up into a couple of different groups that would look at things. Um, it, it's, a, it's a new group, so, you know, I, I think maybe we, we've got to not do five things at once, maybe do two things at once or three. Um, and then once we get used to working with each other and find, find what works well for us, uh, then perhaps we can expand. But it sort of depends also on the 
the state's willingness to support our time on this as well, and, and people's willing to, willingness and a bit ability to commit time. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I think that, you know, in, in the past, we have uh, had um, as many as five reviews going on at a time. And that means five uh, groups of people, and they set their own pace. And some things had no new progress for a month after month. And, and, and other times they were progressing along and whatever pace they set was sort of the pace that it went at. And, um, but it took a lot of time and, uh, and a lot of uh, small group meetings and a lot of individual activities. Um, I think we're in a different world now. And I think one thing that's gonna suffer, certainly five is too many for what we're doing now. And so I think the number of reviews will definitely uh, decline. Uh, and the question is, uh, do we, um, what about the pace of the reviews? And um, should we, uh, I mean, the pace is probably gonna slow down unless we really narrow down to a very few narrower reviews is another way to go. We can, rather than reviewing a, a restoration, we could review a component of restoration or something like that. We have the option of going back and looking at agencies too. You know, the original uh, board just made a decision 10 years ago to do thematic reviews on topics rather than review individual agencies. And uh, so we can couch our reviews any way we want, as narrowly as we want and as broadly as we want. And I think uh, in this new world, that's what we have to think about. The uh, staff supported us very well on the various, on the number of the activities we did. Uh, we can uh, think about requesting more senior level, I'm thinking postdoc level support to do some more of the legwork, uh, high level legwork. That's what I've done. I don't know if we'll get any response back from that, but as one way to sort of compensate for our reduced hours. But it's really us as a board to figure out how we want to move forward. How can we be most effective within the constraints of the timeframes that we're working under? And uh, I think pretty much anything is on the table um, in terms of how we move forward. We do, Lauren Hastings is putting together that review of the effectiveness of our reviews of our reviews. We don't expect to hear back from that till February. That may give some guidance as to some things. Uh, I think if you look at the uh, reflections of the outgoing board members, there was also some interesting ideas in there in terms of how we, how they might have been, or we as a board might have been, might be more effective. Um, so maybe we set aside, I mean, we, we need to start figuring out what we're going to do. Uh, yeah. I can come up with a list of um, things I think we need to do in terms of finishing up a variety of stuff like that and how much time it's going to take. But I think uh, wide open to ideas. And even if we had full state support, um, and, and, and tremendous willingness from all the members to spend a lot of time on it, we would have to contract the number of things that we can focus on just as, as we all learn how to work well together. Um, but I, I think this, uh, this additional thing from the state has really made the waters a lot more turbid and, and uh, difficult to work through. Uh, Steve, it would be useful to see that list of what we need to do that you mentioned. Um, you know, we need to know what we need to do before we can think about other things we uh, could do. I'm happy to circulate that. And it's just my brainstorming ideas. I know Jay had a quick look at it, but I'm, uh, I'm happy to send that around. Could we set some time aside at the next meeting for kind of going through that together and priority setting? And Yeah, and, and, and maybe that it's up? that same thing we can begin to really think about if we're in a position to think about any new reviews or if we want to do some more uh, evaluation of potential review topics or uh, and talk more broadly about the types of reviews we ought to be looking at. As Jay said, when we had these writing groups, they were always volunteer writing groups. And uh, some had three, some had up to five members. 
some folks hardly joined any groups because they didn't have enough time. Some people were on three or more groups. So that's completely, uh, it's easy to do when you get paid by per hour uh, to get volunteers. But, um, you know, so I think uh, we just have to really think about what we want to do. And we'll probably have to plan it for about a year's time frame. as my, uh, we can always reevaluate at any stage, but we have to think about sort of a year's time frame. What do we want to accomplish in a year? Maybe we need to actually have some sort of a, I hate to say operational plan, but some sort of objectives we want to achieve over the next year or something like that. I think uh, Edmund's uh, yeoman work, uh, putting the old reports back up on the website uh, in the new formats, should give us all a much better idea of what kinds of products we're looking at producing, or at least what we've produced historically. Um, so again, thank you very much, Edmund, to, uh, for, for doing that. Well, if you have any, uh, any ideas, feel free to send them to Edmund, if you want to be anonymous, or Jay and I, and uh, directly, and uh, we'll try and compile some ideas together and think about how we might uh, approach that uh, more formally in our in our January meeting. And it sounds like there's some thoughts about. Uh, anyway, I didn't see any strong objectives about maybe holding two meetings a month. Okay, that seems. Um, like we can do it. And we'll try and think about the best way to do that. It may be one might be more administrative reporting from other agencies and things like that. And one more science and reviews and things like that focused to kind of um, uh, differentiate the types of meetings. All right, anything else on that, uh, on upcoming meeting topics? Just, just one comment. You mentioned that one way to simplify is to just do fewer reviews uh, and maybe narrow reviews. One more idea is to produce different kinds of products. You know, less, maybe there are less thorough things that are still useful would be one suggestion. You know, shorter to read, quicker to absorb, but still digging into something to be enough to be useful. Just a thought. Yeah, I one other thought I had when I first came to the board was that since we're, the, the statute says we're supposed to review all of the science in a couple of years, I thought, well, maybe this could be easy. We could just ask every agency to send us their science plan, and then we would review their science plans, um, and, and then perhaps also review how well they fit together. But then I quickly realized that basically none of them had science plans. But maybe in terms of creating an incentive, that might be a way of, you know, shaming agencies into creating science plans for us to more efficiency and economically review. Well, and the other side of the coin is um, listening to our audience and thinking about what might be most effective for them as well, so that whatever we do, uh, uh, there may be hints that they can give us or direct suggestions on what might be most valuable to them in terms of uh, uh, something they can take action on and move forward with. Yes, Tom. Steve, I, I think before we charge ahead though, we really have to see if, if Lauren has any helpful uh, insights into uh, what the board is doing because when she um, interviewed me, she was asking a lot of questions about impacts and uh, the nature of the reports. And uh, it's the first time I'm, I'm aware that we've actually got gotten uh, sort of evaluated that way. Um, now, what you'll actually end up with, I have no idea. But if we could get her input sooner rather than later, I, I think it would be helpful to us in deciding, uh, you know, how we want to structure our efforts. That, I think that's a great idea. I know she's planning to finish it up in February, but maybe we can ask her to give us, you know, some preliminary input, particularly on that aspect of how to make our reviews uh, more impactful. If we can get her to show up in January at our January meeting, I'll ask. Yeah, we can ask. If, her. if we could get her sooner, uh, I think it would be helpful to the discussion we're talking about. Thanks. 
Okay, any other comments on that? All right, uh, any public comments on that topic? Are none. Edmund, do you have any uh, action items? Um, yes, I do have a few. Um, so early in your chair's report, um, you did make a note that the Delta Science Program's um, survey on the Delta ISB is out. Um, you, you, you made a reference that ISB members could take it if they want. Um, but if you guys choose to do so, please be sure to list your affiliation as Delta Independent Science Board. Um, the survey closes on December 18th. Um, in addition, the other follow-up item is for individuals to submit any written comments to the draft outline for the science needs assessment. Um, Jim, we have a few specific follow-up items for you. Um, you mentioned that um, one idea to, to move forward is to have like a panel uh, or, or discussions on what forward-looking science is happening now. Um, so if you want to send that in writing to me and we can have that for discussion um, at the next meeting as part of the planning. I mean, in addition, Jim, you mentioned that um, there needs to be a better written explanation um, that's about the pace of change um, in the Delta. And Steve mentioned that a lot of this work has already been done through a rapid change paper that was prepared by the Delta ISB. Um, this has been submitted to FUSE. And then as an action item for me, I'll make sure that everyone has a copy of that again. Um, in terms of our next meeting in January, it will be about, um, Steve mentioned, reports from the council, the vision of the Delta Science, the new Delta Elite Scientist, along with the monitoring enterprise review. Um, another thing that we have on that list is that there's a need uh, to discuss um, priority setting at that meeting to, um, to figure out how to move forward in terms of what to do at uh, future meetings. So if you need um, input, you can send that to me. Um, and then it seems like at today's meeting, um, no one strongly objected to potentially meeting twice a month um, so we'll um, work on the logistics on that. Um, and then I also have a follow-up item for you, Steve, um, and that you'll check in with Lauren um, to see if she's willing to provide some preliminary information uh, about the science, pro science program's assessment of the Independent Science Board. Yeah, when is our January meeting scheduled for? Um, January 14th. Maybe we can hold one later in the month and focus that on Lauren's report and that broader discussion. That'll give her a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is, there is some difficulties with scheduling at this point for January, but that's something that we can continue to look into. Okay. Um, any follow-up items that, um, that I missed that we should include? Okay, any uh, public comments on that? There are none. Any public comments on anything not on the agenda? Um, there are none. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. And uh, for me, it was a fun time with the HABS discussion and I hope you all enjoyed it. And uh, have a uh, great holidays and a new year and uh, Try and stay healthy, everyone. Yep. Happy holidays to all. Thanks, Thanks to you. Look, looking forward to your comments. Bye. 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 Happy holidays and bye. See you. Happy holidays. Bye. bye.